As I promised, I would give uh, give you a chance for about 40 minutes or so to ask any questions. Uh, we never have time, and we never have a, a place for that, and many people have uh, uh, mentioned the need for that. So I thought that I would just uh, open it up for a little while and see about your, your questions. You, Robert, you wrote questions down, so let's start with you. You, you have a question about fear, is that it? Fear. This is non-professional advice. Do not, do not take my advice to heart. Yes. Um, and then you can summarize. Yes. Uh, can, can you, how about standing up here? Because uh, obviously it's going to be involved. Is that right? Sure. These were questions that occurred to you at Shark Cathedral. Uh, I did. Oh, all right. Okay, <laughs> here. Uh, one, how and why do we internalize Two, what are the components here? Three, what are the precursors, mental and physical, to observe before and when fear comes up? What are the dynamics of fear? And what methods can we use to tackle fear? And does fear serve us? Those are my first six books. <laughs> 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 My little handbook's on fear. <laughs> How and why do we internalize fear? The um, internalization of feeling is what uh, language is all about, what language is for. And uh, in order for it to um, internalize, language must uh, create images. And these images have to find a way to cluster together uh, in order to um, uh, evoke the feeling. And very often, the cluster of, um, of images um, is held together by... Um, we call them ideas, but in, uh, it, it shouldn't be ideas so much, but um, uh, symbol. Symbol holds them together. So that uh, how and why do we internalize fear? We internalize fear through uh, presenting to ourselves uh, an image space which evokes um, that uh, that feeling tone. Uh, we scare ourselves. We are almost never frightened uh, without our consent. I mean, there's such a thing as sudden sounds, a sudden movement, but that's a, a different kind of fear from what you're asking about. You jump because of a sudden movement or a sudden sound, or like Saturday. The Saturday people were having their ritual, and while they were all wearing masks and they were uh, going around with food, all of a sudden, Jerry shouted. And who was it that just almost jumped out of her seat? Yeah. That, that's something else. That's like a fright. But fear... Fear is always uh, internalized through um, language images and held together by some symbolic cue. What are the components of fear? Whatever, whatever that image space is, but the dynamic of fear is lust, anger, and greed. That's the classic presentation of that. Lust, anger, and greed. And um, usually what happens is we permit one of those to be an expressive attitude. In our civilization, it's usually anger. We permit ourselves one of those avenues of expression in order not to incur the psychological uh, 
uh, bludgeoning, which would occur if we didn't express it. There are some people who tried to uh, blow themselves out by expressing all of them at once. Alistair Crowley was one of those kinds of individuals. And what happens is, when you do that, is you become, um, uh, there's a, an, an antiadromian, and you become the devil's advocate. You become a Mephistophelian character then, as Crowley did. And if you ask someone like that, uh, well, why are you doing all this? Uh, the classic answer, answer to that is misery loves company. We want you where we are. Uh, I'm going to do one more and then uh, um, um, <coughs> let this go for a little bit and we'll see what, what else is. What are the precursors, mental and physical, reserved when fear comes up? The, the concomitant of the images is a cycle physical rise in uh, anxiety which floats then the response and also the stimulus. The images are being stimulated and then we're responding to that. And we're involved in both ends of that. This is why there can be such a thing as an internal dialogue because we're involved with both ends of that. That um, level um, rises in us until we feel that we have to uh, react. Threshold sometimes is very low, like in an old-fashioned Italian family. Papa is not going to take too much. <laughs> but for a Zen master, it can rise very high until you finally uh, put your fist through the wall or try to. Um, in the classic uh, 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 Vajrayana uh, technique of dealing with it, you let it rise until it covers you completely. The imagery of that is that the, uh, the first location of that is in the Manipura Chakra. And it um, expands until um, your whole body is fired as it were. And uh, after that, um, the fire goes out. If you let, uh, if you let the, the, the physical concomitant of fear completely take over your entire neurological system, which incidentally is a very scary thing to do, as you can imagine, um, what happens is, is your hair stands on end, literally. Not, not that the hair itself, but that the fear, fear goes through the Saharasti chakra where it exits. And, um, your sense of presence can float above that. And you can, um, you can calmly observe yourself, uh, completely falling apart, as, so to speak. It's a very, very interesting phenomenon. What are the dynamics of fear? Um, flat tires in the middle of Idaho. Those are the dynamics of fear. <laughs> Why is <isn't> that? <laughs> other, other questions. Other issues. Yes. Reading um, from the part of the Gita this week, uh, Chris was talking to Arjuna, and he says before you can really uh, commune with the eternal spirit, uh, it's important to uh, harmonize the uh, qualities of each of the senses, the mind, and reason. Um, the quality of reason, what's intrinsic to that quality? Uh, how is it distinct from the mind? And um, are there some uh, other examples from other traditions uh, uh, to talk about this quality of reason and the other things. Yeah, that, um, <clears throat> that quality of um, reason is actually a pace. And clear thought has a, uh, has a, uh, a pace. 
that has a presentational rhythm which is appropriate for exposition. And mind, as the, uh, as the host for this pace, is distinct from the pace itself. Uh, the classic saying in the Indian tradition is that walking is the correct pace of sensory. So that uh, generally, um, like for instance, the way that I first learned about the Bhagavad Gita, I was about 17. I was at the University of Wisconsin. And um, I got into a heated argument in uh, the uh, uh, what's called the Rath shelter there. And uh, some graduate student in Stahl Agronomy, took me aside, he was an Indian. He was from Nagpur in central India. His name was Sudarshan Pure. And he said, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, I can see that you have a quick mind, but it's completely untrained. He said, the first thing that you need to do is to hear the Bhagavad Gita. And so, uh, being 17, he took me on a long walk, about 17 miles around a lake that's adjacent to the University of Wisconsin campus, and recited to me in the old um, uh, Sanskrit, the Bhagavad Gita, and then gave me the translation. And it took all night to walk around this and get this. And I was amazed. But the exposition was given in this kind of a natural classic pace. I didn't know at the time. And what happens is, is that when you take reason like that, you get to see that there's always a form to the process. Mind does not have a form, but reason always has a form. And the correct form is almost like a sine wave. So that um, brain waves do not come from the mind, they come from the, the, the reasoning function, the psychodynamic function, which is, which is thinking itself. But mind does not have any kind of shape whatsoever. It, ha it can take whatever shape um, the pace of thought has. But in itself, as I said. So that um, in the Bhagavad Gita, the 18 sections of the Bhagavad Gita are a classic presentation of three sections. And when you read the Gita, it, it has this kind of pace where the first six present the situation, the next six deepen it, and the next six put it into. Uh, a mode where you could practice it. So the Gita has this kind of a, of, of a structure, a tripartite structure, but done in clusters of six like that. I don't know if that, does that help at all? You have some examples from other traditions where the way you talk to breeze and have to call it other terms. And, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, uh, um, in medieval Western thought, the founder of scholasticism was St. Anselm, and he's the one who took the Aristotelian syllogism as the, as the form for all logical thought. So that you have um, your uh, syllogistic presentation, which is then as a triad. You can only develop from a base which has a, a subject predicate, and uh, you can only move in this kind of emotion. So that the pace of Western logic in the scholastic medieval presentation was again in this triadic um, uh, movement. All arguments flowed with the same atomic unit, as it were. There's a great deal of similarity between medieval Western thought and medieval Indian thought, incidentally, which is not. How about an easier question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. We're at a disadvantage because we use English discursively. In Chinese, uh, ancient Chinese and in ancient uh, Greek or ancient Sanskrit, the language is primordial and it, uh, its capabilities of these subtle differentiations are are much easier. <laughs> the German word that Jung uses for soul, Sila, uh -huh. is not at all mine. Okay, no. no. That that would be what we uh, what we would call as we're talking here. That would be um, uh, reason. Yeah. Yeah. See, the soul must be must be logical. It's a logical entity. It uh, it, it has to make sense, and the only way that the soul can apprehend God is uh, by uh, acclimating itself to um, the, uh, the the reasonableness of of God, and this is done through uh, that mental uh, structure. So there's affinity, but it's not at all mine. In the Greek, the term nous, N-O-U-S, is, um, is the active leading edge of consciousness. It's like the guiding lantern of consciousness, and that's what we would call you know, intelligence. Now, the difference between reason and intelligence, reason is form. It is a structure. It has to do with the structure of thought, but we tend to think of intelligence as an intuitive um, clue finder, which then uses reason. But both um, uh, intelligence and reason operate within a field which is mind. Like a field, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In fact, there are great parallels between uh, um, uh, late 20th century Western thought and um, very refined Asian thought about this. Um, you've read the Tao of Physics, how um, scientific uh, language about electromagnetic fields is a cognitive parallel to the way in which Taoist or Buddhist thought um, conceives the uh, mind. Purists would say that they don't conceive that it is mind, but in our discourse, uh, yeah, we can say conceive mind. Easier questions. Does anybody have really something easier to talk about? Yeah. You mean about the uh, about the uh, um, ineffectiveness? It's a it's a, um, a it's an issue of ex acceptance. In this way, any meaning can be generated, but truth is established by our accepting certain meanings 
and our acceptance of it makes it true. In the 20th century, the problem generally is that no one can accept any meaning as uniquely final anymore. This in itself has happened before. And as we've been talking about in, in the other Tuesday nights, it seems that the last time that this happened en masse, like it's happening uh, in our time, was around the first century of um, A.D. <coughs> that we find individuals at that time, in the earlier part of the first century A.D., not in the later part, but the earlier part, facing the same kinds of issues that we face, but in particular, vis-a-vis -vis the inability to accept any particular unique meaning as a final truth. So that it's not so much that um, that the gods um, um, are dead, as Nietzsche said, but that uh, no one accepts them uh, any longer as uh, adequate. Uh, unique presentation. What this does is it uh, brings up the quality of the unknown. God becomes an unknown. Not a non-existent, but an unknown, so that the really sensitive human beings then realize that they have to go out into the unknown and, and discover all over again. That the divine becomes uh, a mystery, which cannot be um, solved by any known existing meaning. So that uh, instead of generating meaning to find God, uh, one has to um, uh, have the courage to go out into the unknown. And what makes the unknown so uh, uh, tremendously fearful is that we don't, we don't have any meaningful uh, rails to hold on to. There are no paths. So that your um, spiritual speaker then uh, becomes a, a very rare bird. Most people under those conditions will take any uh, good sounding surrogate. That's why you get so many false religions in times like this. False uh, gurus and anything that sounds plausible and by that, uh, anything that seems synchronistic, syncretistic, thrown together. Oh, here's a new combination. Maybe this recipe will work. Or no, here, look at this combination. This guy's got some Sufism. He's got some uh, St. Augustine. And he's got just a dash of love. So this sounds fantastic. I can make it with this, at least through the weekend. So those, those kinds of exotic recipes um, only wet your taste for clinging in a more clever way. When the actual uh, process, the intelligent process, is to recognize that um, there, there are no known ways that are going to work, but the acceptance of the unknown is truthful. So instead of accepting meaning as truth, one accepts the unknown is real. And this, in a way, produces, I have to use that term that uh, Heraclitus and Jung use all the time, it produces an in, in anti You go from realizing that you don't, there, you have nothing to go on, but you're going to go anyway, and that evokes a kind of an eerie exactness out of you. You get exact in your intuition. And the first thing that you you begin to sense is you know what not to do. You know so-and-so is a phony. Even though they look good, they sound good, uh, they, they don't have the right tone. They don't have the right feel at all. And you start shying away. And this is why it's classically called the via negativa, the negative way. You start shying away from all the phony, from all the falsity. And you find that that's all, the only legitimate comportment that you have. But as you know, when you, when you back away in an intelligent way, 
You don't just recoil, but you become strategic about what's happening. And you find that there is a center, but that the center is specifically unknown. And, and the honesty of that uh, realization then uh, makes that one's guardian spirit. The unknown becomes one's guardian spirit. Becomes quite real, as you know. Aren't there any easy questions? <laughs> yes. Six hundred BC. Well, as you know, around six hundred BC was the um, the second wave of the exile. The Neo Babylonian Empire had become unified around 700 BC. And in order to staff this empire, they had to find um, people who were able to work. And so a lot of the Jews were taken around uh, 700 BC. This is the time of Isaiah. Then a hundred years later, when the Neo-Babylonian Empire was at its zenith under Nebuchadnezzar, he again needed a, a, a brain trust, a talent pool, and again went to uh, the Jews. The reason was is that um, the Jewish temperament has always been great at international conception especially international trade, international uh, uh, law, and so forth, able to comport in that way. And so around 600 BC, almost all of the talented Jewish population were taken to Babylon. Those who um, refused to go were killed, and there was just a small handful that went into exile into Egypt, and then the Babylonian, Neo-Babylonian Empire invaded Egypt and took all those. Jeremiah was taken there. The Greeks at this time were just beginning to solidify their sense of um, city-state. The great lawgiver for Athens was Solon. And uh, Athens and the uh, Greek cities along Asia Minor, Miletus, and uh, some of the other cities were in a uh, great uh, cultural revolution at that time. The, um, the first wave of the great pre-Socratic thinkers was happening about that time. And they were looking for what was the very best, what was not only good, but what was the best in the universe? What was the the, the basic uh, uh, core? And it was about this time that you have people like Pythagoras who are a bridge between uh, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Jews, the Chaldeans, and the Indians. You have travelers like, uh, like uh, Pythagoras who knit all of these together. So that you have the beginning seeds around, uh, oh, say around 570 BC, you have the beginning seeds of international communities like the, uh, like the, uh, the Jewish exile community in Babylon at that time. The leader was uh, Ezekiel, who has a great vision. He has a vision that's not just Jewish, but a vision which is cosmic. The same with Pythagoras. He has, a, he has a vision of man which is not just Greek, but which is cosmic. And so you have, in that first generation after 600 BC, you have individuals in the, both the Jewish and the Greek tradition which have a universal vision. This incidentally spreads through the whole world at this time. It's the time of the Buddha, the time of Lao Tzu. It's the time of uh, Confucius. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's almost like someone plucked a cord which says that the mind of man 
has to look up from their individual traditions and see the total, the all. In fact, the, uh, the original term, symbol, comes from symbolon. And symbolon means of uh, the, the pithy saying that one can take into your mind and open it up train it to open to uh, the cosmic visionary scale. Does that help at all? Mm -hmm. There is an element in the Pythagorean school, yeah. that early on. That's why later on when you have uh, uh, ascetic uh, communities in Judaism, they're always based upon the Pythagorean model. Qumran is a Jewish um, ascetic uh, retreat which is based upon the Pythagorean model. It's not based upon the Buddhist model at all. You know, you find these books everywhere now. I guess, uh, can I mention some names? It's like Elizabeth Clare Prophet and, and people like this, but Jesus being in India, they're just ignorant of the tradition. They don't, they can't tell the difference between uh, uh, Buddhism and Pythagoreanism. There's a great deal of difference. For instance, I'll tell you one major difference, and you can see right away. In the Pythagorean tradition, both men and women are in the same community. Pythagorean communities are always men and women together. Because the harmonia is there uh, when you have those two elements together. In a Buddhist uh, community, um, this is not so at all. There might be an aesthetic community for women, but it certainly isn't a part of the men. And if you look at uh, Quamran or the Therapeutai, there were men and women together. So the seed of that comes in around um, a little after 600 BC. The classic statement is in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says that the special covenant which Israel has always had with God has been torn up. And that there will be a new covenant on the basis of individuals one by one with God. That there's no more guarantee because of your uh, lineage and heritage. It'll have to be established individually, one at a time. The Greek tradition after that is that the individual is um, the only focus of the inner life. The community helps um, bring individuals together, but it's the individual who is the focus. So there's that share quality. If you're interested, uh, C.H. Gordon, Cyrus Gordon, has written a number of books on this. The Common Heritage of, uh, of the uh, Greeks and the Jews. Little question? <laughs> Simple, easy question. Sure? I as to how one would go about changing one's thinking. <laughs> changing one's thinking. That's a hard one, Jerry. <laughs> well, <laughs> if you go four days without food, you'll become very practical. You'll learn what <laughs> practicality is. You'll learn how dedicated you can be for achieving a single goal.
Because thinking is always a structure, you can inculcate any structure that you want into your thought. You can learn to think in, in many different ways. And uh, sometimes it's very useful to train yourself to think in a different way from what you've grown up with just to see that you can do this. Um, I guess in our time, uh, the fastest classic way is to learn calculus. If you learn mathematics through integral and differential calculus, you have a really good model for what mind training really is. Does that seem to see? No. No. Unadventurous. <laughs> yeah, if you think in German, it's quite different from thinking in English. Any, any language. Which just it shows you that the, the mind structure can be changed. You want, yeah, I think, if I may, I intuit that you mean modify your current thinking rather than change the, the, uh, the pattern of thought. Yeah. The, the best simple manual that I know is Benjamin Franklin's autobiography. He goes very simply and methodically into the whole issue that he realized that he was kind of an average, ordinary character and he wanted to um, change himself, he wanted to develop himself, and so he kept a meticulous, detailed uh, journal of doing this. And I think somewhere along the first uh, uh, tenth or, or fourth of the book, he makes a list of the exact techniques that he used to modify himself. And he did. He, he, he made it work. The second best example, I think, would be um, uh, Gandhi's autobiography. Except that Gandhi... Gandhi takes a long time. He takes 20 or 30 years and doesn't mind. Whereas Franklin wanted to find out in a couple of years, you know, how can I really change this? Uh, invite them in. Yeah, bring them right in. Uh, we'll need a, a chair. Oh, okay. Good. Hello, come in. We have chairs in here. We have chairs in there. So, come in, come in. We're just about ready to, to finish up here. So I recommend uh, something like Franklin's autobiography. It's, uh, it's really useful. There was a later development of that by Henry Adams, the education of Henry Adams. If you have time, the comparison of the two are valuable. I'm reading at the Huntington Library now, and I'm going to do a book on Franklin and Thoreau, their um, patterns of self-development. Because it's interesting to see that whereas Franklin is very, very practical Yankee, Thoreau, by the time he's um, 19 years old, is already completely um, outgrown the, uh, the American um, matrix. When Thoreau is uh, uh, 20 years old, he makes a translation from the original Greek of Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound, and he says in his journal, he's just begun a journal about a month and a half before, he's, he says that he wants uh, to stop nothing short of um, his cosmic self. So you can take this a long way, but I think Franklin is, is interesting because he's a, he's a time-honored kid. How about uh, three more questions? Yeah, still here. Yeah, the you know part of the part of the the difficulty. 
Uncle Carl Jung discovered in thousands of hours of therapy that modern man has a medieval mind, his image base, his emotional body, as it were, tends to be very medieval, as if he is stuck in that capacity at that time on that level. But that the structure which holds that goes back to a classical time. So that you have a double problem which resists analysis. You have an image base which is medieval, held together by a structure which is classical. So that if you become very intellectual about it, you'll get the structure, but you'll miss the emotional imagery. And you'll still do the same thing, but you'll condemn yourself because you're doing it. Or if you're just, uh, you go into it and you, you find an expressive way out, You'll be able to deal with the feelings, but there's no creativity to it. You can't, there's no way to restructure it. So. so it seems that our problem today, in general, is this kind of a, we're on the horns of a dilemma. And the, and the only thing that anyone can say, in, in all honesty, is that there is a necessary balance between the two, which is indispensable. And that that balance is the only guide that we have. And like we said before, with uh, Will's question, we have to take that balance into the unknown. And that's why it's so, that's why it's so, um, uh, it's paradoxical. We have to not only have the spiritual courage to go into the unknown, to discover the unknown, but we have to take a sense of balance with it. Oriental traditions uh, sometimes uh, help, but uh, I think most of you have had enough experience to see that they are, um, they're not paradigms, they're parallel. They can confirm or they can augment, but you can't base yourself on it. Because for, um, for the Orient, um, uh, the unknown, the void, is not a challenge at all. Whereas a psychological situation is that for us it is a challenge. There's nothing we can do about it. We've been uh, slapped in the, uh, in the psyche with the challenge of the unknown. And we must um, um, not only respond, but we have to accept the challenge before we can respond. And you can't do this with an, an Asian uh, uh, paradigm if you have a Western sanction. You can, you can use it as a parallel. It's the classic case, I'll just give of my own personal experience, uh, one example, classic case of a, a Zen Roshi, a Westerner, who rose to um, the uh, command of um, a Zen center, an urban Zen center. He was a hand-picked person from a very great Zen master, a Japanese Zen master. And uh, when that Japanese Zen master died, this American Roshi um, slid into graft and corruption and into manipulation and didn't notice at all in his, in, in himself that he was doing this. Had no idea until, uh, was confronted by, uh, by people who wouldn't take this and said, you're just a, a petty gangster. And threw him out. John got rid of him. No name. No name. So we can use these as, uh, as parallels and as confirmations, but the use them as paradigms um, uh, deludes ourselves. The questions are so radioactive, it's shrinking the cassette. 
Did you see how small that cassette became? Uh, yeah. Two more, and then we'll we'll adjourn to food and and drink and drink and food. Perhaps there are no more. Then they'll let me off the hook. If you put it that way, you have to hold that out for just a second and not let it uh, gain too fluid and blip the currency. It's not so much a new kind of thinking. It's like this, what Sylvie said, there's a balance. Feeling and thinking. There's a balance there. And when you balance those two, there's another pair that can then to balance that. Not only feeling and thinking, but there's an intuitive quality which is there, which is quite distinct from thinking. And also quite distinct from feeling. And there's a, a sense quality, a sensation quality also. So that when you balance, it's not a question of balancing two, balancing polarity, but it's balancing for completeness. And when you balance the completeness, you can see that to have a completely new kind of thinking and just accept the completely new kind of thinking actually is an illusion. Because it means then that the other three functions are going to be uh, required to make transformation. You're going to be required to make transformation to them, which may be beyond you. To make the kind of transformation to the intuition to match the new kind of thinking might be beyond most of it. Well, that's what they tell us, and they say that there are leaders. And uh, I, I, I go away humming when when that happens. You see, yeah, there are, there are a lot of things that one has to watch out for in this world, and one of them is the guy that what is it you say from the guys and dolls? That Masterson says that uh, his daddy told him that someday some man's going to come up to you and he's going to tell you that the flower's going to take great peace in you and that the stuff is that you can be patient. Sure enough, the flower's going to spurt great peace in you and you're going to holler. So it's, it's like that. Yeah. The structure of thought always follows a kind of a hierarchical build up based on these kinds of units, like that logical unit, the syllogism, when the body had to do that, that, that side of the record. If you have a completely new kind of thinking, it tends mostly to be this kind of false syncretism, which parades and masks as somebody's exotic recipe. I've got 4% species, I've got 85% Protestant uh, uh, congregationalism, and I've got a swift 9% from Dollars. And we're going to go with it. And uh, we've got the people and the staff. You know, it's this kind of thing. And, you, and you, the only thing you can do is, is walk away because you can't argue with such people. Okay. Anything you say is fodder for them. Yeah. Beyond that are the tax people. <laughs> and so maybe <laughs> one one more please and then we'll so we'll go to our, our food. Uh did you want to pursue uh oh okay. Go ahead. Yeah. 
one thing, uh, just to, to make a specific enclosure, one thing that can be done is we can tell stories. Telling stories, children, is extremely important. The telling of tales, with all the sense of the, of the person, and the love and camaraderie, and the evoking in the child's mind of the, the mythic horizon through this, this personal contact is extremely important. It's something that is not done. Television does not work. The, the effect that television has is almost like the eyes that we have. Rather than what we want is that the mind uh, awakens in a kind of a proper way. We just hear a little bit radio program with uh, 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 Lucy or Uncle Lucy that used to be on for an I don't know if it's still in. That was a wonderful kind of There are others who hear. But I think that's important. I used to take my daughter around in the evening um, when she was just you know, a few months old up until she was about four years old, and take her around just before she went to sleep, and we would check on the world, the stars, the trees, and the grass, and, and see if there were things going on, how they're doing, if they're ready for sleep, how we're ready for sleep. So there's a kind of a sense of, of a finisher going on. And things were uh, One last. Well, no, I think that that um, has been uh, presented before, but uh, I think the, the book form seems to, to bring it out. You know. If, you know, when you get acquainted with the treasury of world thought, you get amazed that what's been gone over before. It's absolutely astounding. I don't want to go into it too much, but uh, almost all of the forms have been uh, thought of and discussed and, and done. That's why completely new thinking is very simple. It's, a, it's an old problem. Do you recall Zeno's paradox of running the race halfway, Achilles versus the turtle? Achilles runs very fast, but he can only run half the race, and he will never reach the finish line. There's, a, there's an approach which becomes asymptotically negative. You will not, you will not reach it. So if any kind of a sequencing, any kind of a progression like that, which is piecemeal, has built in to it that kind of asymptotic negativity. That's why do gooders who plan uh, turn out to be very bitter later on in life. Almost always. The, the ones who are going to save the world at 25 are the ones that are gnashing their teeth at 7. It's a question of not planning, but of, um, of understanding that this is a full matrix which works together, and you do what you can, and the reality of just as it will. So a little humility. Let's get into food, and then we'll have some entertainment uh, in, uh, oh, how about uh, 40 minutes? Is that enough time to drink everything? Or it depends on how fast you get. Yeah. Yeah,
Renaissance English language and a robe is a robe. This is robe is supernatural. If you say it, it's a wine. It sounds almost like robe. But you got to be super strong. Robe is supernatural. By this relate, what is sensu, the shape of man, swelled up so far beyond, at last being able to instant the image of the hydrogen bomb, bloom amid his veins, viscera, robust in royal, purple, and radioactive soul. Behold, His majestic colossal, highness itself, the cinema, but hardly more, never really ours or me. At last, he seemed able only to sweat, supposedly snap. And there is no flowering in it at all, none, except the purely exceptional fictional art. So here and now we are shaped to be beyond science fiction, futurized touch, but just alone in high seas of pure possibility. No landfall, no thing. From this returnless world, wave relentless sea against scale and safety. Thus, there and ever, you retell in compulsive glory each wistful thread that led apart and bled pathetic language from rotten bones. Beyond living, betraying life to fantasy without metaphor, a robe of impossible glory, of apocatastasis. And so between those two, there always seems to be some kind of an arrow in the blue. And it turned out to be this one. As you know, I've been working on trying to intuit the Jesus for a long time and been surprised at uh, what I've uh, found. And this one was just a free shot wide open. And its title is Jesus and Alexandria. The magic and bright wisdom. And Jesus strode out of Alexandria toward the home, grown and ready for everything. Tall, red haired, firm stepping, the master therapeutic mule, hands closed upon his skirt, eyes upon the road back, leaving the canopus gate. Behind, he waved the flat sweet signal that has been done well within. Now let nature rest. Steady, sandals sweet and dust. Steady your eyes, drill and distance. And birds, scattered, sing. And then to calm down, this one last one, last one, uh, written just a few days ago. It has a kind of a Walt Whitman sounding title. Remember his uh, descent of rolling lines and lilac glass in the graveyard and rooms and that. So, not even thinking of that, but being inured in Whitman for 
40 some years, this came out and this one rolled. The title is Buddha Within the Monsoon Rain. Give it that. Buddha Within the Monsoon Rain. Simple. Cascading language style with the monsoon rain shimmering quiet. Cloud forest slope heavy feet sharp all above winter grows soon within the windy worldly way. Awake, deeply plunging conscious ways, watching images change, tidal currents, karma whirling pools, fun free. Cry from a distant place. Ancestors far from him, the whirling world, centripetal, seven. God. The Buddha within this monsoon meditation has to be Interval practice. Interruptively deep and deep. Cloud Cloud bent sky. River. Falling waterfall. Winter retreat without the winter wording away. Away. Two thoughts in the back. Eight in the back. Thank you, thank you. And uh, first on for my distant possible relative from Pennsylvania type film, Dr. Helen. Stephen will read a passage that most of us a thousand times have recalled with the chuckling delight and also that kind of apprehensive, level eyed appreciation for just pure excellence. A little section from Tolkien from The Hobbit about the archetypal interview with pure evil in terms of answering the law. There are two things that ought to be said, perhaps. <laughs> Introducing this, one being that um, it was really Roger who, um, at uh, the latter part probably of a, of our own life, taught me to appreciate the summer school. I always considered me, myself and still do a um, equinoctial person, because at the equinoctial is the um, opposite me, just like the uh, little twig of hobby. Going down into the bowels of the earth, meets the shadow creature column. And uh, those are the power points that are my favorite. But somehow, the, uh, the high point of the light of the sun, which those of us at Transylvania are uh, always somewhat suspicious of, because it affects us in, in strange ways. And, uh, and of course, the low point of the sun at the, the winter source, which also has uh, importance. And then, um, uh, the second, of course, is that this creature, Gollum, who, um, whom the little hobbit meets down in the bowels of the earth, is a shadowy being. He is a relative of the hobbit, and he has uh, withdrawn for various reasons into this shadow land and has become very malign and very evil. Um, he speaks in a hissing, gurgling manner, which is disturbing to people, and at certain times, particularly on New Year's Eve, I tend to, um, uh, in my own way, imitate his voice and put it on my uh, radio answering device. And so, um, so um, and you, you may, 
you may have thirty points, call four six seven two six five eight and get this message. Good. Good. Yes. Press that. Yes. Leave. It's not sincere. Leave us a message, my friend. We want this. We want this. Yes, we do. If it won't leave us a message, my friend. He comes over and he gets hit by the neck and he squeezes it. Come, come. Yes, 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 yes. That is the standard message which for now, now I think for about 30 years has always been recorded around New Year. So you see, we are, we are dealing here with an important archetypal figure and uh, Roger selected this piece. And for some reason, you seem to think that it might sound better when read with a Hungarian accent. I don't know why. I'm sure that Professor Tolkien did not anticipate that, but since this is the, the boss's order, that is how it shall be. So the clever little hobbit is down in the bowels of the earth, having his encounter with Gollum, who is fully prepared to strangle him, and uh, he takes this sort of clever interaction to save himself and actually prevail over this um, adversary. Um, the Hobbit jumped nearly out of his skin when the heat came in his ears and he suddenly saw the pale eyes peeping out at him. Who are you? he said, thrusting his dagger in front of him. What is he, my prophet? whispered Gollum, who always spoke to himself. Um, through never having anyone else to speak to. This is what he had come to find out, for he was not really very hungry at the moment, only curious. Otherwise, he would have grabbed first and whispered after him. I am Mr. Bilbo Faggin. I have lost the dwarves and have lost the wizard, and I don't know where I am, and I don't want to know if only I can get away. What? He got in his hand said, said Gollum, looking at the sword, which he did not quite like. A sword, the blade, which came out of Gondolin, said Gollum, and became quite polite. Perhaps you sit here and chat with it a bit, see my fracture. It likes riddles, perhaps it does, does it? He was anxious to appear friendly at any rate for the moment and until he found out more about the sword and the hobby, whether he was quite alone really, whether he was good to eat, and whether Gollum was really hungry. You know, that is the question. <laughs> and, uh, leaders were all he could think of. Asking them and sometimes guessing them has been the only game he has ever played with other funny creatures sitting in their holes in the long, long ago, before he lost all his friends and was driven away alone and crept down, down, down into the dark under the mountain. Very well, said Bilbo, who was anxious to agree, until he found out more about the creature, whether he was quite alone, whether he was fierce or hungry, and whether he was a friend of the goblin. You asked first, he said, because he had not had time to think of a riddle. So Gollum hit. What has roots that nobody sees, is taller than trees? Up, up it goes, and yet never grows. Easy, said Bilbo, mountain, I suppose. Can it get easy? It must have a competition with us, my precious. This precious ass, and it doesn't answer, we eat it, my precious. <laughs> if it asks us, and we doesn't answer, then we does what it wants, see? This goes its way out, yes. All right, said Bilbo, not daring to disagree, and nearly bursting his brain to think of riddles that could save him from being eaten. <laughs> Thirty white horses on a red hill. First they camped, then they stamped, then they stamped still. That was all he could think of to ask. The idea of eating was rather on his mind. I was rather an old, it was rather an old one too, and Gollum knew the answer as well as you do. Chestnut, chestnut, he hit. See, see, my precious, but we have only six. Then he asked his second, voiceless it cries, wingless flutter, toothless bite, mouthless mutter. Half a moment, said Bilbo, who was still thinking un uncomfortably about eating. Fortunately, he had once heard something rather like this before, 
and getting his wits back he thought of the answer wind wind of course he said and he was so pleased that he made up made up one on the spot this was part of the nasty little underground creature he thought an eye in a blue face saw an eye in a green face that eye is like to this eye said the first eye but in low place not in high place said Gollum He had been on the ground a long, long time and was was forgetting this sort of thing. But just as Bilbo was beginning to hope that the Rex would not be able to answer, Gollum brought up memories of ages and ages and ages before when he lived with his grandmother in a hole in a bank by the river. My Hector, he said, "Come on the day he is near the sun." But these ordinary above-ground everyday sort of riddles were tiring to him. Also, they reminded him of days when he had been less lonely and sneaky and nasty. We all tend to have such memories, yeah. um, and that puts him out of temper. What is more, they made him hungry. So this time he tried something a bit more difficult and more unpleasant. It cannot be seen, cannot be felt, cannot be heard, cannot be smelled. It lies behind stars and on the hills, and empty holes it fills. It comes first and falls after, and lies here to laughter. Unfortunately for Gollum, Bilbo had heard that sort of thing before, and the answer was all around him anyway. Gone, he said, without even scratching his head or putting on his thinking cap. A box without teeth is key or root, with golden treasure inside his teeth. He asked to gain time until he could think of a really hard one. This he thought a dreadful easy test, not though he had not asked it in the usual words. But it proved a nasty poser for Gollum. He hissed to himself, and still he did not answer. He whispered and spluttered. After some while, Bilbo became impatient. Well, what is it? He said. Uh, the answer is not a kettle boiling over, as you seem to think from the noise you are making. You are such an Let it give us a chance, my best. <laughs> well, said Bilbo after giving him a long chance. What about your guest? But suddenly Gollum remembered feeding from nests long ago and sitting under the river bank, teaching his grandmother, teaching his grandmother to stop exquisite, exquisite. Then he asked. Alive without breath, as cold as death, never thirsty, ever drinking, all in air, never creeping. He also, in his turn, thought it was a dreadful easy one because he was always thinking of the answer. But he could not remember anything better at the moment he was so frustrated by the answer. And all the same, it was a poser for poor Bilbo, who never had anything to do with the water if he could help it. I imagine you know the answer, of course, or can guess it as easy as winking, since you are sitting comfortably at home and have not the danger of being eaten to disturb your thinking. Well, let's hope that that is the case. Um, Bilbo sat and cleared his throat once or twice, but no answer came. After a while, Gollum began to hiss with pleasure to himself. Is this nice, my precious? Is it juicy? Is it consciously constable? He began to peer at Bilbo out of the dark. Half a moment, said the hobbit, shivering. I gave you a good long chance just now. You must make haste. Haste, said Gollum, beginning to climb out of his boat onto the shore to get at Bilbo. But when he puts his own webby foot in the water, a fish comes out in a fright and fell on Bilbo's toes. He said, it is cold and clammy, and so he gets fish, fish, he cried, it is fish. Gorm was dreadfully disappointed, but Bilbo asked another riddle as quick as ever he could so that Gorm had to get back into his boat and swim. No legs lay on one leg, two legs sat near on three legs, four legs got some. Can you, can you imagine how being in eminent, being in eminent danger of being eaten, and then you have to guess things like this? You know, this mm, I hope I don't dream about this predicament tonight. I hope you don't see that. Um, it was not really the right time for this riddle, but Bilbo was in a hurry. 
Gollum might have had some trouble guessing it if he had asked it at another time. As it was, talking of fish, no legs was not so very difficult, and after that the rest was easy. Fish on a little table, man at table sitting on a stool, the cat has the bone. That, of course, is the answer in Gollum soon gave. Then he thought the time had come to ask something hard and horrible. This is what he said. This thing all things devour. Birds, beasts, trees, flowers. North iron by steel, grinds hard stones to meal, plays king ruins town, and beats high mountain down. Poor Bilbo sat in the dark thinking of all the horrible names of all the giants and ogres he had ever heard told of in tales, but not one of them had done all these things. He had a feeling that the answer was quite different, that he ought to know it, but he could not think of it. He began to get frightened, and that is bad for thinking. Just keep that in mind. Really. <laughs> Gollum began to get out of his boat. Oh my. He flapped into the water and paddled up to the bank. Uh, paddled to the bank. Bilbo could see his eyes coming towards him. His tongue seemed to stick in his mouth. He wanted to shout out, give me more time, give me time. But all that came out with a sudden steel was time, time. Bilbo was saved by pure luck, for that, of course, was the answer. <laughs> I think that should, that should probably do, you know, of course, that eventually he, he was saved and he got out by um, simply asking the question, what have I in my pocket? Which was the ring, the famous magic ring that he had found and which was originally belonged to his enemy. And, of course, um, the nasty creature could not guess had his cut in his pocket head, and therefore had to let him go, and that is how he got out of that position. Just, just remember, as George Ivanovich Gurdjieff was wont to say, the clever man gets out of this world alive. And, uh, you know, not just a nice, nice person, not just a well-intentioned person, not just a, a feeling person, not just a good person, not just all of this new age, but a clever person. And a clever person knows about readers. So keep that in mind and that in all shall be well. writing a certain kind of a way over the years uh, that based on anti-gravity. Uh, man rising vertically in the air, uh, breaking out of the prison of the Zodiac. 
and through language, man is free, or humanity, I think, is free, and uh, one can talk some face visitors. For me, I wanted to make the beat and uh, work with the astral level language. And uh, in this book, The Vertical Rainbow Climber, I'll uh, read uh, one production. And uh, it's a uh, poem dedicated uh, to uh, the French uh, philosopher, Rene Genome. And uh, Genome was involved in talking about the dangers of the modern secular materialism and the secular world mentality. And uh, what he was concerned with was the teaching humanism uh, in that honesty of secularism. And uh, his whole idea uh, was to return to uh, traditional culture. Okay. And he said, when you say traditional culture, you mean man's connectedness to the sky and the earth and one thing is continual. And uh, so he said, we're, we're, we're nearing some kind of end at this point, at one kind or another, as regards our secular world. And uh, this poem is uh, dedicated to him, and it's entitled Apocalyptic Sundown Matter. Not the corpse or some cataleptic organ grinder's magic, but blankness, aboriginal blankness, where death consumes its own death, becomes space from the liquefied logic of the Fraunhofer spectrum. Public scenes abated, nervousness answered by the silence of silence, then the long start walking, ASAC stepping to ASAC, the beam core driven by spiral engineering until the universe is emptied of its final manzantara without the momentary physics of places interrupting our racial dawn and death completed as the empty core of space, time is crushed like an ember, becomes its own subverted shadow, space, apocalyptic car sets, compressed in the blood, the amorotic stone belt. We are caught in the hands up position of movies, proclaiming our treachery, our violence, our accumulated wrath, seeping from the edge of a postage needed frenzy. We are a force whose heyday is trampled by cameras perched within the rooms of howling hothouse flowers. Pictures revolving in our souls of missed chances, of lost opportunities. The aura is black and rusty, painted point by point, from the melted stones of Chinese Jesus to the eucalyptic urns of blinking eyeball daggers. The silence overcoming our brains like the lead of an insane foreboding. The shamanistic ethos we release from the lower throat bone psyche and the path that we take is like a boot of bleeding rhinestones caressing sundown shadows in autumn. Skies with the tumultuous feelings of no race. The golden eye of research faded, the globular knapsack of frozen earthquake changes, match making sandstone prayers for Hashish Madonna. Paul Marx is Dilated eyes painted redemption from errors and tells us he did not commit. And he is right, innocent as an ill constructed bridge collapsing. This was the tragic subsoil of mythical infertility, blankness hammered through the eye of the needle, emptiness beating from this final Mandan Tara above the weeping stone of empty dialectics, force whips broken by massive flames, throwing kidneys. Elamantus cried to the soul. Microscopes probing through the solar system bone, the bone that weakens itself to its energies dimensions until the universe is flattened across some telescopic bar stool, blocking and British. The drinking man answers the underground demon, only to find himself in a third eye movement with eye seeing feathers springing from his fourth hand. He is holding the fingers of time reflected in his navel. Telescopically enchanted by the hyper metaphysics of darkness. This world, supported by the mundane lead of carpet makers' brilliance, takes off its hat at the base of the spine, signals down the ponies of lightning, 
spread bread with the skull of the caterpillar fetish so that nothing is seen except the empty concentration of falsehood. It leaves it repeating itself daily by the gram, the ounce, the bucket, blinding our feeling with hyperbolic short juice deadness. Teeth scattered across the landlocked sea of an eyelash as we send up our smoke into chaos, promoting underground angels that swell up the pride, wrecking hearts deep blood against absence until they smother the soul with irresistible concrete, the discourse of life abandoned by shadows, time dirty with cursy in its eardrums, the alchemical babbling of nothingness, lifting vein by vein, the wound in its former existence. Um, thank you. <laughs>